You are listening to a 31 Pearls production audiobook. All rights are reserved. No part of this video or audio may be reproduced. Chapter 7 of the Book of Creation Extracted from the Great Book of the Sons of Fire Read by 31 Pearls Herthu, Son of the First Father The Book of Beginnings tells us all things began with Verkalpha. Therein called on Kalpha, from whom flows Guinan, the energizer which stabilizes all things, so they maintain their proper form and Awen, which responds to the molding desires. This is well enough. But men concern themselves more with the beginnings of their race. And ours is rooted in Herthu, the sun-faced. Son of the First Father While Herthu was still young he was expelled from the lush lands where he was born. And he journeyed across the harsh lands in the company and keeping of wise Habris. After many days they came to Crocasus, cradle land of our race. Land of mountains and rivers, which is beside Ardis. And they encamped there in a valley. With them were retainers and flocks. Herthu grew to manhood there. And always Habris was at his side, instructing him in all the things he should know. He taught her through the nine essential disciplines of Imian and the secrets of the three sacred vessels. Herthu learned that there was a place of gloom where the air was foul and malodorous breezes carried pestilence and poisonous particles. This was the source of all maladies and ailments and of the things which cause putrefaction and decay. This place had been closed off from earth, for it existed in another realm beyond the ken of mortals. But it had been brought into attunement with earth when a forbidden act was accomplished. Thus the bodies of mortals became susceptible to influences from the baleful place. To this and similar parts of the other world, the wicked would be drawn when they passed through the grim gates of death. But Habris taught a different conception of wickedness. One where lack of effort, indolence and indifference to duty and obligations, the taking of the easy path, were just as wrong as actual deeds of wickedness. He taught that men reach the true goal of life by transmuting lust love into true love. That true victory is gained only over the defeated bodies of their vanquished passions and baser selves. These and many other things were taught by Habris. But many of his teachings displeased the people of Crocasus, who were then as they were before Herthu's forefather was led away. So Habris concealed many things from them and taught by simple tales things within their understanding. He taught them the mysteries concerning the wheel of the years, and divided the year into a summer half and a winter half, with a great year circle of fifty-two years, a hundred and four of which was the circle of the destroyer. He gave them the laws of well and woe, and established the folk feasts of harvest tide and seeding tide. He taught them the ritual of Ulysidui. But Habris instructed Herthu in the ways of the other world. He taught him concerning the three rays from the central invisible sun, which manifest all things, upholding them in stability of form. Also concerning the Oversoul, which filled everything in creation, as the Soul Self filled the mortal body. This Soul Self, he declared, would develop from mortal sensitivity and feeling, transmuted into divine, sensitivity and feeling, through suppression of the baser instincts within mortals. It was strengthened by development of feelings of love between man and woman and between these and their kindred, by the appreciation of beauty and devotion to duty, 
by the development of all qualities that pertain to humans and not to animals. Herthu learned that the soul self is quickened by soul substances outflowing from the Godhead, that the strong soul is transformed and molded to the soul's desire, but the weak soul is not its own master. It is flabby, unstable, and is pulled into a state of distortion by its own vices. In the afterlife, there is unbounded joy for the entry of a noble soul. It will glow with splendor and stand out proudly. The mean soul of the wicked is dull-hued, twisted and drab, and, being drawn towards its own compatible state, it shrinks into the dark places. When Herthu had barely crossed the threshold of manhood, black-bearded spearmen began to ravish the borders of Crocasus. And Idalver, king of that country, called his fighting men together. And when word came to Herthu, he prepared to depart. But Habarus bid him stay a while, for he was unprepared for battle. Then Habarus prepared a strange fire with stones, unlike any fire seen before. And when it burnt low, he plucked out that which is called Child of the Green Flame. And he beat it out, so it became a blade. This he fitted to a horned hand grip. And when it was edged and blooded, gave it to Herthu, saying, Behold Dislana, the bitter biter, faithful servant of he who strikes hard and true. Then he made a shield of wicker, covered with ox hide and a cap of hide, which came down over the face and neck. So equipped, Herthu went to the encampment of Idalver, taking eight fighting men with him. In those days, men fought with hand-thrown spears and clubs, with flung stones and sticks sharpened by fire and weighted. But they did not close in the battle clash. So when Idalver saw the battle blade of Herthu, he wondered, and it passed, his understanding. But when he saw Herthu close on the battle line, and the foemen fall before him, he was amazed. No man about the king could understand the making of such weapons. Offspring of fire and stone. But Habris made others, and Herthu became the king's right-hand man and the first hero of the noble race. The king offered Herthu his daughter's hand in marriage, but Herthu declined, saying, The days of my manhood are not yet fulfilled. When the war-filled days had passed, Herthu withdrew to the place where Habris made the bright bow blade. And already he had taught the mysteries of their making to others sealing their mouths with magic. But Herthu was less concerned with the weaponry of war than with the mysteries of life, and the battles of the spirit beset by mortality. So while his workmen drew bright blades from the thunderstones, Habarus taught Herthu and his battle brothers. And these were the things they learned from his mouth. Beyond God there is an absolute, which no man should try to understand, for it exists and has always existed, in a state beyond man's finite comprehension. It is from this absolute that God, the ultimate in all perfections, was engendered. To create, God first visualized in thought. Then he produced an outflowing wave of power, which, in a manner of speaking, solidified what might be called building stones. The outflowing power also produced the celestial hymn, which brought the building stones together in harmonious forms. So it is truly said that all creation is the harp of God, and it responds to his song and manipulations. It is an everlasting unfoldment. The voice of God can also be heard in the voice of his beautiful daughter who endows all growing things with life and beauty. There is a divine purpose in creation, which may be known only to the few, 
This knowledge is the key to all unanswered questions. Acquiring it is like the drawing back of heavy curtains, which have kept a room in gloomy half-light, so all things suddenly became clear and distinct. He who gains this knowledge knows the grand secret, the answer to the riddle of the ages, and knows beyond a shadow of a doubt. This divine purpose and the divine secret concerning it is called Gwenkelva. Apart from Gwenkelva, God gains nothing from his creation. Except that, as a being possessing infinite love and goodness, he must have something to receive the gift of love and respond to it. Even among mortal beings, who is there that could find satisfactory fulfillment in self-love? Also, he needed something wherewith he could contract himself. Some medium wherein he could perform, and this is creation. Creation is also, for mortals, the school of life. The training ground for godhood. There are three circles of reality. Three realms. Three stages of existence. They are Heaven, where perfection visualized on earth, may be realized. And desires and ideals materialized. Where hard striven for aspirations are attained. It is the place where all the properly developed spiritual potential, latent in man, reaches maturity and fulfillment. Earth. The place of training, development, and preparation. The testing ground. The battlefield where men discover their true natures when confronted by life's challenges, contests, and contentions. Where competition and controversy are the rule. It is here that aims and objectives are conceived and thought out for realization later in the proper place. It is a starting point. The beginning of the journey. It is here that the proper road must be wisely chosen. Then there is the realm of the misty horizon, the intermediate place, the place of spirits, where those above can commune with those below, and where free spirits wander within their limitations. These things which Habris taught in those far-off days have been rewritten in transmission to accord with our understanding. But it is unwise to voice them in these troublesome days when words become snares to entrap the unwary. Now, Idalver desired to learn the secret of the bright blade engendering thunderstones. But no man who came with Habris or labored for him would disclose any part of it and the king was afraid to put them to the test. So, having thought the matter out, the king sent for his daughters and told them what he expected them to do, for he had devised a plan to learn the secret. Then he sent an invitation to Herthu and Habris. When they arrived at the king's encampment, they found a great gathering in their honor and the king's daughters favorably inclined towards them, one smiling upon Herthu and the other upon Habris, who was at the age of hoary-headedness. Though at first Habris was indifferent and wearied her, the king's daughter pandered to him, encouraging even his follies, setting out to charm him with her wit and beauty. It was no great length of time before her womanly wiles ensnared the heart of Habris. And though he was almost ripe for the surrender of secrets, the damsel's efforts had taxed her and the game became tiresome. So there came an evening when she could not endure his company. In the midst of the merrymaking, when the ale bowls had made many rounds and the sound of song and story was at its height, she slipped away with a young battle man who attended upon her father. Many who sat among the benches saw this and whispered to one another, 
nodding knowingly in the directions of Habris, who was not unaware, though he appeared to have drunk to his capacity. Habris had learned to love the young woman, so he was sorely heart-smitten. But within himself he knew the tree of winter love bears only winter's fruits. Yet he made excuses to himself for her, thinking perhaps it was just some girlishness, with no more weight than a floating feather. Nothing of serious import. For it was true the merrymaking was better suited to the natures of men than the natures of women. Maybe, he thought, it is just an innocent indiscretion. So when the day came to its fullness, and those who had made merry went heavily about their tasks, Habarus approached the king and asked for his daughter's hand in marriage. He said, Your daughter Clara has delighted me with her winsome ways. She has charmed me with her gaiety and beauty. She has displayed much pleasure in my company. Surely I have not misread the signs. The king was not overpleased, for though he greatly desired to know the secret of the bright blade, he had not intended giving his daughter's hand to Habris, but neither did he wish to offend him. Therefore, he was wary in his reply, saying, It is the custom for any suitor, for a high-born woman's hand, to be himself high-born, and worthily battle-blooded. Yet such is my affection for you, that I would not let even the custom become a bar to this marriage. And you may be a battle-blooded man among your own people. But let us not enter lightly into this thing. For the girl is still young, and it would be well if you established yourself favorably with her. She will be a worthy wife indeed. For she is one who is ever ready to learn. One with an inquiring mind. Nothing gives her greater pleasure than the acquisition of knowledge. So the matter was left. Now, some days later, Idalver and his retinue, accompanied by Herthu and Habris, went to the gathering place for folk feasts some five days' journey away. People were accustomed to meeting here every thirteen moons to celebrate the season of fruitfulness, many coming a great distance. Beside the gathering place was the compound of a far-framed seer and warlock called Gwydon, who in the fullness of the moon on the third night would prophesy events for the forthcoming year. Idalver and those with him presented their gifts and took their places before the compound. Presently, Gwydon came out cloaked in the skins of wild dogs with a horned crown and skull-headed staff. He seated himself before a small fire, into which he threw prescriptions, making a cloud of smoke which completely enveloped him. When this had drifted away, he seemed to be asleep. But after a while, he lifted his head. Then raising himself up, he started to prophesy. He talked a while of small matters, then told of dangers to the people through enemies who would bear down from the north lands. He prophesied a great bloodletting, telling people they could be saved by a great war leader, a king knowing the secret of the bright blade, himself a war wielder of one. He exhorted the people to bestir themselves and prepare, wasting no time in finding their leader. No man among the people knew the mysteries of the Bright Blade, except Habris. But he was not a man of battle, and Herthu was not high-born among them. So, though they talked long, they talked in tangles, failing to resolve the issue. It was then decided each should go his own way. But they should meet at the same place again at the next full moon when Gwydon would be able to help with their decision. When Idalver returned to his encampment, 
He was no longer hesitant about the marriage of his daughter, ordering that it should take place forthwith. But he stipulated that Habris must initiate him and his sons into the mysteries of the Bright Blade immediately. This being agreed, arrangements for the marriage were put in hand. Habris and Clara were married, and Idalver and his sons partially initiated into the mysteries of the Bright Blade. For the king was told it would take some time for the initiation to be completed. So when they next went to the meeting place, Idalver was proclaimed the war leader. With his sons to follow, according to their ages, should he fall in battle. But Habarus had spoken to Gwydon in secret. And matters were so arranged that should the sons of Idalver fall, then Herthu would become the battle chief. The king and those with him returned to their home compound, where they were to prepare battle men. But Herthu was to go back to the gathering place, and there train fighting men in the battle tactics, which brought them clashing into the fore. Now, on their wedding night, when they had retired to their bower, Clara burst into tears and fell weeping with her head on the knees of Habris, confessing she was not a virgin and had deceived him, begging his forgiveness. Habris raised her up and said, Even the wisest of men becomes a fool when his heart blinds him to reason. The older the fool, the bigger the fool. He did not question her regarding love for he knew she could not love and deceive him. She had given her heart, and with it her virginity, to another. Yet he made an excuse for her to himself, thinking that she had not willfully deceived him, but had acted out of duty to her father. Also, truly loving someone and wishing to demonstrate that love, she necessarily had to sacrifice the happiness and content, the self-respect of her husband-to-be. The choice had been hers to make. It is ever so. Habaris asked if her father had known how things were, and she said, He suspected, for am I not his daughter? Thus Habaris found himself tied to an unloving wife, for he chose to disregard the custom of the people. He wondered, was she also to be an undutiful and unfaithful one? A woman reserves herself for her husband or she does not, according to her marriage criterion. A woman reserved for marriage is one unlikely to be unfaithful. A woman easily come by before marriage is no less attainable afterwards. For if she says love is the criterion, then she measures by something unstandardized, which may figuratively vary from one inch to a mile. A man declaring his love may have seduction in mind or a lifetime of protective devotion. The marriage proposal determines the difference and establishes the intent. After the marriage, the king showed little concern for Habris, for he kept Clara's young battleman in his retinue when he should have dispatched him elsewhere. Nor did Clara maintain the restraint and decorum which dignifies wifehood, except in their outward manifestations, which is no more than a deceptive crust disguising the polluted love beneath. Thus Habris bore the shame of belittlement in the eyes of men. For Clara, was furtively unfaithful. Habris visited Herthu, and on his return, told the king that he and his sons would now receive their final initiation. So, having made preparation, they set off, accompanied by Clara, to the place of the Thunderstones. This, being a deeply cleft mountain, wherein there was a large cavern from which flowed a river. Entering the cave, Habris told those with him to bide where they were, 
for only Idalver, his sons, and Clara were to accompany him into the place of initiation. A small cave entered through a long, narrow passage, closed off by a heavy door, and lit by fire already prepared. A fire which burnt tardily with a blue flame. When a length of time had passed, those who waited without grew uneasy, but it was long before they approached the door. And when they did, their throats were seized, so they were affrighted and fled. And one among them died. Then, those who knew the mysteries of the Thunderstones came and cleared the way. And all within the cave were found dead. Habarus did what had to be done. For though it is well for men to conform to the laws of men, there is a super law by which men, who are men, should live, and which sometimes decrees that they must die. Herthu married the daughter of Idalver, and they had a son who died in his seventh year. Idalver's daughter died in childbirth. The invaders came and were defeated with a great slaughtering. And Herthu became the first king over all the people of Crocusus. <laughs>